Good evening, Western Standard viewers, and welcome to Hannaford, a weekly politics show of the Western Standard. With me today is uh, one-time Liberal MP Dan McTeague. Now he is the president of the Canadians for Affordable Energy. And we're going to be talking about the plans of the Liberal government to make us net zero by 2035. I think it can't be done. I'm going to ask Mr. McTeague whether he thinks it can be done. We're going to have some fun with this one. Welcome to the show, Dan. Great to be here, Nigel. Thanks for having me. It's uh, an honor to be here in the Western Standard and the Hannaford uh, show. Uh, hopefully, we'll do more of this down the road. Well, Dan, it's an honor to have you, too. Uh, I don't think everybody would necessarily know that for 18 years you were a member of Parliament. You were actually a Liberal member of Parliament. And I have to ask you, uh, before we even get into this, is this the Liberal Party you knew? Not at all. It's completely foreign to anybody who spent time with the Liberal Party. And by the way, my lineage to the party goes back to 1974. Uh, when as a 12 year old, I was uh, licking envelopes for the Honorable Hugh Faulkner, the real environment minister back in the day, worked uh, again for Paul Cosgrove in 1979, 78 and 1980, uh, again uh, in 1984 uh, and ran in 1993, was successful after running campaigns for several other liberals. So my uh, my tenure in the party is extraordinarily deep and uh, I can say with absolute certainty, this is not the same liberal party balanced, pragmatic party of the centre that try to straddle issues and try to find con consensus and common, uh, a common purpose uh, in its policies. It is very much a, a left-wing construct, and I would uh, classify it as more of a, uh, a left-wing branch of the NDP uh, than it is, of course, the Liberal Party that I knew and that so many of us have come to know as the pragmatic party of the centre. So, uh, no, not at all, and I'm not uh, afraid to say so and to dispute its legitimacy as the Liberal Party. <laughs> Dan, that, that kind of confirms the suspicions that a lot of us have had out west for quite a long time. I'm, I'm glad to see that it's penetrating in the east as well. But anyway, one of the things that this, this progressive liberal party has been trying to do is to take us to a, a net zero carbon emissions by 2035. And one of the ways they mean to do that is to switch us all over to driving electric vehicles by that time. What a lot of people don't realize is that they are phasing that in early and that as soon as, and I need to consult my notes here, um, in less than 18 months, by law, one-fifth of all new passenger cars sold in Canada have to be electric. And I think uh, by 2030, which is only six, you know, this could be your next car. And by 2030, it has to be up to 60%. Now, if we're going to have that many electric cars on the road, where is the power coming from? Because at the same time they're doing this, they're bringing, uh, you know, new population into Canada. Everybody who comes in is going to want to turn on the lights, cook their meals. Um, we need a huge amount of electricity, and yet I don't see any new construction of base load generation. Yes, there's all kinds of solar panels, there's all kinds of things that only work when the wind blows, but... I don't see the baseline generation coming. So this looks like absolute chaos of objectives to me. How does it look to you? It looks like uh, bad central planning, and we've never seen that work anywhere in the world, even under its previous uh, iterations under communism in Russia or in China. Look, the reality is that uh, we don't have the power needed to meet that objective, assuming that plan were to work. The fact is these things are out of reach for most people, most Canadians, and most Canadians, whether you are here in Ontario or in Western Canada or in the East, our climate simply does not permit this kind of vehicle to be taken up with any great zeal. Forget the cost aside. So for, you know, planners, central planners uh, working the bureaucracy in Ottawa, uh, once former activists for various organizations, you know, uh, uh, scaling uh, the CN Tower or, uh, you know, uh, Ralph Klein's house. Uh, the reality is that these people are should not be in a position of advocating any type of timeline because they can't possibly meet it. And by any realistic measure, which of course is, demonstrates the extent to which this Liberal Party has become bereft of reality and, uh, as I said earlier, pragmatism. Uh, they're imposing uh, ridiculous goals that cannot possibly be met. In fact, this morning, even the parliamentary budget officer said, not only are you not going to reach those goals, but right now, for most Canadians, to reach that goal of 60%, as you mentioned, in 2030, 
uh, you know, you're going to have to ensure that the price of electric vehicle drops 31%. That isn't going to happen, not without the massive subsidies it takes to build, not without the massive subsidies it takes to create infrastructure, not without the massive subsidies to incent people to actually drive these things. The reality is that even if they were to get them, sell them as used, they're not worth it. And we net well know now that most common sense manufacturers globally, auto manufacturers are walking away from this in droves. Nigel, I live no more than three kilometers away from the Ford plant here in Oakville. This was uh, a billion bucks given to that company, federal and provincial money. They've walked away from it. They threw out 2,700 workers, said they're going to bring in the EV. Now they've decided not to do it. Instead, they're bringing in what people really want, the F-250 Super Duty. And that's going to start in 2026, not EVs. This reality, I think, is now starting to shower the liberals and those out there who believe in their own press releases that somehow they can uh, they can ma make these things happen with massive amounts of borrowed money and without infrastructure to support as you mentioned not just infrastructure to produce energy but also to distribute that who's going to build and get the distribution boxes what kind of mining are we going to need to achieve those goals the reality is it's not practical and it's uh, the kind of stuff of uh, you know of, uh, of of fantasy that i think uh, uh, magic and make believe is no way to conduct public policy and that's one of the reasons i believe the federal liberal party and its planners are doomed in the next 12 months and there will be a replacement in government where common sense once again remain, remains uh, the, the stead in Canada. Well that point you made actually about the, uh, the the secondary distribution system it's not just the big overhead lines that take uh, power lines that take the power it's also the the stuff on the ground that takes the power from the transformer into your own house. The little community I live in is a transformer serving 40 homes the first guy who wants to plug in an electric vehicle is going to be all right. Probably the second one too. The yeah. third one, uh, you know, it's going to affect people's freezers. So I, I have real, you know, that's not, he's not going to be a popular guy. So, um, but look, this, if I'm not a, an expert in this, you are. If between us, however, we can see that this is an impossible dream. Is it the case that they don't see this in central government or that they see it and just don't know what else to do, so blindly barrel on. I think it's a lack of, uh, you know, it's a question of look, don't look before you leap. And they've done that. They've done so because in the United States, the Biden administration, now on its way out, at least Biden, um, from what I can see, uh, made a decision to invest trillions of dollars in terms of the Inflation Recovery Act, Reduction Act. And what that basically meant was the federal Canadian government would have to, in it, uh, with the provincial government hopping on board and other governments across the country would use this as an opportunity to uh, to as, as it were pillage the uh, you know the uh, the finances of this country in order to achieve goals that are simply impossible to meet look spending 52 billion dollars or committing that kind of money to get 19 billion dollars from investments from automotive manufacturers isn't going to work and it's not a very good you know it's not a very good way of conducting public policy if in fact you're incenting people two to one for every dollar they're investing you're giving them back to i don't know whose math or what financial creative uh, juices go into the minds of those who've made this idea but it's an impossible demand and it's based really on the what i think is a a, a very undefined i would almost say fraudulent discussion about what net zero really is if you're saying that carbon is bad for the world when in fact it's not a pollution it's in fact the giver of life it provides uh, the greening of our and the quality of our life you know if you're saying that you want to get rid of that and at the same time bankrupt nations and force people into vehicles and to do things that they can't do and to somehow stunt growth and development i mean that's a recipe for disaster and those who are advocating it are absolutely mad and insane and have no business in public policy, nor should they be anywhere near advocating changes that uh, I think are leading everyone to the conclusion this country is going in the very wrong direction. Okay, now you mentioned a moment ago that um, the, you reminded us that there's an election coming up the next year uh, and there could be a change of government. Now, one of the things that we know about big business is that once they get committed to a certain course of action, it's like the, the oil, oil tanker analogy. It takes a lot to turn it around. And can you conceive of a situation in which big business is pleased enough to see a different government with better ideas, but doesn't even move the wheel, doesn't even try to turn because they are afraid that the investments that they make today or next year, four years later, would be at risk 
because of a return of whether it's the Liberals or the NDP or somebody else altogether who has the same kinds of destructive ideas that you have just characterized as a disaster. Well, Can we rely on something yeah. new if there's a change of government? I think manufacturers are already signaling that they're walking away from this. I mean, Ford Motor Company is no small in, you know, company, uh, has been a very significant, uh, uh, has a great proud tradition. It's privately held, has never asked government for loans or bailouts uh, because they've gone bankrupt not once but twice, as Stellantis, which is formerly Chrysler, or as, say, uh, GM has done. Um, these are companies that are with, along with Mercedes, Toyota, the company I worked for for several years before being elected as a member of parliament in public relations said, no, listen, we think that the best penetration be 30% EV market. That's it. We are not going in that direction. We're going to try to provide other solutions based around fossil fuels, maybe even a bit of hydrogen, who knows, but they're not going to put their eggs in one basket. Ford has said pretty much the same thing, unless they can produce a vehicle that makes money the, from the get go, the moment that car drives off the lot with a new uh, with a new buyer, they're not going to invest in EVs, no matter how many inducements the federal and governments on both sides of the border are prepared to make. So I think it's become a fool's errand for those who looked before they left, did not look before they left, basically jumped into this without taking into consideration the long-term impacts. And that's not just the federal government. The provincial government in my province, for instance, has made similar silly commitments uh, in, in order to try to prevent and to uphold what has been the, you know, the strength of our economy, the automotive sector, while completely sacrificing you know, the, the reality of consumers not being able to make ends meet and re recognizing that the world does, in fact, want and will continue to need internal combustion engines as they meet a certain criteria that cannot be met by, you know, driving around electric toasters or whatever kind of uh, widget you want to call it. I mean, it's not practical. There's a reason why 100 years ago society walked away from the EV and it did so because it was not the kind of thing that one could commonly use day in, day out. Batteries are not like internal combustion engines. They do not have the density, they do not have the, the, the energy properties. At the same time, they're also extraordinarily, extraordinarily you know, cost efficient relative to any other alternative methods. And so unless someone has you know, deep pockets and money that grows off trees, I know that's the NDP and the current liberal left ideology. But you know, I think reality is starting to hit our politicians and planners right between the eyes and to recognize that they got this thing awfully wrong. I wonder if, it, uh, if that reality really is hitting them between the eyes. I'm sure many of them have realized this, but the ideologues at the top, and I guess Mr. Gilbo would be one, Mr. Gilbo, yes. who by the way, famously within the last year said that they weren't going to issue more money for road construction as though that road, the need for roads was going to disappear. Um, I wonder if uh, people who think as he does would be so distressed if there were less cars on the road and people didn't travel so far. Do you see? Uh, do you have any suspicion that that there may be a strand of that thinking in their decisions? Very much so. There is an attempt to try to clamp down on our freedoms. Uh, these are bad news bears. These are Debbie Downers who do not like the fact the population has been very successful. Canada has been very wealthy, driven by its uh, economic diversity, its in its uh, uh, its uh, energy diversity. Look, my province runs on electricity through uh, through uh, power plants, through nuclear power plants. Your province uh, through uh, fossil fuels energy, and thank goodness. Because I can tell you, between the two of them, we have not only cheap energy, we have the revenues to, sell to, to let governments know that they can sustain this kind of social programs that Canadians take for granted in many cases, but cannot do so when we consider that, uh, you know, clamping down on the very things that make our country attractive and lucrative, when you deny the world the things that Canada has, it's only Canadians who wind up carrying the cost of this. And so I think there's a real pushback to the fanatics and the uh, activists who've been promoting their uh, their wares. By the way, grifting has been another problem. These are organizations that go out and tell us, tut -tut us about, as to how they think you know we should operate as a society, but are the first ones to put their hands out to receive tens of millions, if not billions of dollars in, uh, in, in charity monies or direct contributions by the federal, provincial, municipal governments. That money doesn't grow off trees. It comes ironically from the oil and gas sector, which produces about 25 billion net dollars every year for the federal, provincial, municipal government. So the irony isn't lost. It may not be lost on Western Canadians, but it's now becoming a growing reality in the Eastern part of this country, especially in Ontario here, where people have had enough. They're fed up. And like Maritime Canada, where we saw an increase in carbon taxes last summer, it coincided ironically with the turn in the electoral fortunes of Mr. Polyev against Mr. Trudeau and his uh, his sidekick, Mr. Singh. 
want, I, I want you to just do a little informed speculation here, Dan. If the government were in a position, let's just say they won the next election. So we had another four years of, uh, of Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Gilbo, and all who sail in them. And they are sitting there with this the dilemma that in order for uh, their grand plans to put more electric cars on the road to be realized, they're going to let Chinese imports in yeah. and basically kill Ford, Stellantis, and General Motors in Ontario. Is yeah. that a decision that they would make? Well, I think it's a reality that they're going to have to confront because that's exactly what's happened. Look, China made a move 15, 18 years ago to move towards electric vehicles because it could not penetrate or break through the iron wall of North American and European internal combustion engines. Not only to make them well, they made them efficiently. Uh, they're completely recyclable. They're cost effective and they're the way of the future. Uh, as long as we're prepared to continue to recognize that we need energy to uh, to you know to grow our economies, then uh, that could be met. But China has no interest in going that road because they know that that road would take them to a you know, a certain dead end. And now they have vehicles that they can't sell in their own country, so they want to dump them on the rest of the world. I mean, if we want these prices to come down, we're going to have to allow the Chinese to you know sell you know Geely. They're going to have to sell their you know, BYDs uh, and their other uh, even their uh, their Teslas. Uh, in order to bring these prices back to a level where I think people can find them as competitive as an alternative. That's not going to happen. The Prime Minister made it very clear, as did the United States. The answer is no. Tariffs are 100 percent. You know, Trudeau had to make a decision. Does he obey China or does he obey the United States? And given all the money that he's wasted building uh, an infrastructure and industry that will not work and that uh, these are simply dogs that will not hunt Canadians do not want electric vehicles. Yeah, you got 10, 15 percent of there who are always going to be trendy and willing to try anything, provided they get some grift and some money. But when it comes to the expense of an economy that is deteriorating, there's no way under the sun any Canadian in their right mind will want to buy one of those things, recognizing they don't live in California or Southern California. They live in cold Canada. I don't need to say that to people in Alberta, but increasingly here in Ontario, anywhere north of Toronto is cold. Yes. Well, uh, and that, of course, is the the fear here in Alberta that if you have, if 10% of your new vehicle fleet has to be electric, then there's going to be a lot of competition for the 90%, because for all the reasons you've just articulated, nobody's going to want the 10%, except those people who kind of live two miles from their office. And, you know, you, you could do it with a golf cart, I guess. But uh, for most people, that's not the option. You're living in I don't know, Grand Prairie or uh, Coombe or something like that. And you've got 40 miles to go from where you live to where you work. Yep. And it's 30 below and your little electric car, even if it keeps running for that length of time, you're going to be frozen like an icicle when you get there. So they're not going to want to buy the EV. But for every nine people, there's got to be one. And then in 2030, for it, it's it's 60, 40. So... What's this going to? You are in the car business. What's this going to do to the price of new cars <laughs> or secondhand cars? New cars will remain high. The price of used vehicles will be nonsense. We know batteries don't last as long as internal combustion engines. Look, I have a vehicle outside a 2003 Chevy uh, Silverado 5.3 liter engine. It's going to go to 600, 700,000 kilometers as long as they keep the oil changed every uh, five, six thousand kilometers. Mm -hmm. The same cannot be said for your batteries. And it depends really, if we're talking the lithium battery, by the way, an invention that came from the oil sector itself, Exxon developed that uh, technology many, many generations ago. But if anybody believes that that's the way we're gonna see our future, forget it. Your mining, your agriculture, your heavy lifting, your airlines, uh, your, your trains, nothing is going to, they might run a hybrid, but they're certainly not gonna run straight EV. And to suggest as some have, that we have the infrastructure necessary to accommodate that massive increase is delusional beyond comprehension. Those who are suggesting this aren't just dreamers. These people are insane and we ought not to be following them. If anything, I think the next government is going to have to spend four years sifting through the debris and the damage uh, of what is left by a government that had no option but to simply say, 
uh, we're going to spend public money. We're going to indebt the nation to the point that it, it be, becomes uh, apparent, I think, to everyone except for our bond rating agencies who should be downgrading Canada's credit. I'm not saying that because I want that to happen. I just think that uh, they're so woke they don't recognize you cannot use the CPP to leverage the amount of debt this country has uh, has uh, has uh, has incurred. I say that as a Liberal member of Parliament because we had to fight that massive debt. We did a lot of very unpopular things to get that debt under control. And if think, people think this is a joke, just wait till it only takes one credit agency to come out and say Canada's uh, credit rating is not worthy. It cannot support itself. We better be selling a hell of a lot more oil and natural gas in order for this country to pay off the massive debts that is incurred in, in, in this flight of fantasy, believing that we could wokefully go down this road of ESG, uh, you know, net zero, uh, the great reset and uh, bring uh, about this idea that everybody should be driving uh, you know, uh, electric toasters, uh, sorry, electric vehicles. It's the same thing. <laughs> Let me ask you this. We're, we're sort of coming to the end of our time, but I would put it to you, Dan, that if you care about freedom and you said you did about five minutes ago, you talked about the damage to personal freedoms. I would say the ability to jump in your car and go wherever you want, without any permission from anybody, is one of, the, one of the foundational definitions of freedom. And it's perhaps a lot more useful than a vote in the sense that it's something you do every day. What do you think of that as a definition of freedom? And secondly, it is one of the pleasant things we do at the weekends. We jump in the car and we go somewhere. We go to the mountains, we go skiing. We go for a drive around the lakes. We go for a, you know, we go to visit a friend who lives 100 miles away. Well, transportation is... We will still be able to do that? Yeah, I think... Nigel, I think transportation is an integral part of our lives in our society, uh, not just to connect with each other, but also to have that freedom to move around. The government has made no secret of the fact, the federal government, that it wants 15 minute cities, that it does want to control how much you drive, how much you eat, what you eat. There's a whole litany of things that go into this rubric of net zero. The fact, as I mentioned earlier, these are real depressing people who believe that society you know, has should not advance, should not grow, and should have be, somehow be constrained because uh, we're doing in, inordinate damage to the, uh, to the environment. The reality is far different than that. And I think we're doing, we're far more environmentally responsible. That's a word I don't hear a lot of liberals talk about these days, this liberal government. They only want to talk about CO2 and, and carbon. They don't want to talk about other environmental issues, remediation, uh, what's needed to, uh, to, to resolve, to improve our air quality or the health of, of Canadians, uh, the quality of our lakes, our rivers. Instead, it gives permits to cities like Montreal to go dump sewage into the, uh, into the Great Lakes and into the uh, St. Lawrence uh, River. Look, I think they've got it all backwards. There isn't a th single thing that these people have touched. They have the Midas touch in reverse. Everything they've touched has turned to garbage. And I think that's the problem is that it's going to take a long time to repair and get these things back up and running. But make no mistake, limiting your ability to ex ex exercise a quality of life that is enviable around the world is something they want to go after. And it's the result of that that I think this Liberal government and its friends, uh, its, its coalition friends in the NDP, are doomed for political annihilation in the not too distant future. Okay. Very last question, Dan. What is the mission of Canadians for Affordable Energy? Well, what we're doing right now, Nigel, to discuss and have a sober discussion about policies that this government has advocated and ideas around this notion that we can somehow get rid of our energy prowess and that we can somehow abandon the very things that have made Canada unique, attractive, and affordable and affordability above all. You know, when I left Gas Buddy five, six years ago to take on this role uh, from my 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 friend, uh, John Williams, I wanted to make sure that we what we were saying would, as would happen did in fact take place. Everything that we've talked about, not just with EVs, but this net zero fant you know, uh, fantasy that we are on has now come to be true. And for that reason, it is policymakers who have had an uneven hand in determining and shaping what is a very dark future for most Canadians. It's not Canadian. It's certainly not the dream that many Canadians had hoped for. And I want to be, you know, like everyone else, provide an aspirational future that puts resets this country, puts it back on the right track, and gives the next generation an opportunity to benefit from the uh, from the vast menu of energy options this country has, which by and large are world class, 
very, very much leading, very environmentally conscious, but at the same time, taking into consideration what is important for most people, affordable energy. Well, Godspeed on your mission, Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, Thanks, Dan McTeague, President of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. For the Western Standard, I'm Nigel Hannaford. Good night. Thank you. If the name Ted Byfield brings back fond memories, well, we got a party coming up for you guys. On September 25th, Toasting Ted is what it's called. It's going to honor a great conservative who published Alberta Report News Magazine. It's going to be bagpipes, singing, live auction stakes, speeches by Premier Smith, Preston Manning, Stephen Harper, quite a lineup. The Western Standard is the, the final incarnation or the latest incarnation of Alberta Report that Ted Byfield uh, founded. And I mean, he was a great Albertan. He really made his mark on this province. And this, this evening of celebration for him is really going to be outstanding. You get there, toastingted.ca. That's the website. You can get your tickets. This one's going to sell out. I mean, again, if you want to see Smith, Manning, Harper, all in one spot, one night, be sure to get there.